I'm Billy, I'm an alcoholic. Hey, and I definitely can't live up to that. So, um, my home group is the Alfreda Unity Group in Alfreda, Georgia. My sobriety date's January the 5th of 1990. I have spoken here once before. I want to say in either 99 or 2000, sometime around there. Um, and it's good to be here. I mean, just pulling into the parking lot, I mean, I travel a lot for work. Um, so I go to a lot of meetings where I'm not from. And, um, you know, just even realizing myself how much I take AA for granted. That it's always going to be there. Even if the meeting is horrible. I won't be with the people I work with who are getting hammered. You know, I can probably at least get a bad cup of coffee. And, you know, I can connect with people who are just like me. And, you know, this is, I am a person up until... March 16th of this year, on March 16th, I spoke at a 7 a.m. meeting in Florida, and I have a house down there, and I was working down there, and um, that is, after that meeting, that next week became the first time in my sobriety that I had not gone to a meeting in, like, I don't know, five days or six days. I could honestly not think of a time since 1990, even in a correctional facility, where I had not at least gone to two meetings that week. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, I'll tell you a little bit of my story, and it's not that great, believe it, whatever Wallace said, but um, it is amazing to me to talk to a lot of people who have struggled during the last eight months. And I kind of put them in two camps. Um, I have um, the people who have done everything except the program of Alcoholics Anonymous in Alcoholics Anonymous. So they were forced to have no fellowship, no meeting location, no home group, and yet they've really never done anything to take care of their alcoholism. Um, big wake-up call for a lot of those people. I'm not judging. I'm just telling you that is one significant group of people who I have come into contact with the last eight months. The other group is the exact opposite group of people in AA. The people who scream from the rooftops that meeting makers, if you say meeting makers make it, you're killing people. As long as you have a spiritual experience as a result of the 12 steps, you don't need meetings, you don't need this, you don't need that, and most of all, a lot of those people, I find that I, they work their way, somehow come to me, uh, they don't have a committed home group. They have been so into the spiritual experience of the 12 steps that they found kind of a committed home group to not really be, you know, an important part of AA, and what I've found for those people, and it's funny because Tom used to talk about a lot about these loose gatherings of meetings, kind of like orphan meetings. They are not a home group. They um, really don't have any existence outside of the prescribed meeting time. And what I have found for a lot of those people is that because they just drop in here or drop in there, they have no connection to people to regular people that are used to seeing them once or twice a week. Um, and believe me, it's made me very grateful because I have not done this thing perfectly for 30 years for sure. Um, but what it's made me grateful for is that having a home group, I would argue, is the single most important thing in Alcoholics Anonymous. I would argue that, you know, um, and it's funny because at lunchtime today I sat in my car on a break from work and participated leading a big book study on Zoom. And, um, you know, it's interesting that line, and I'll, bot I'll butcher it to death in working with others. But it doesn't just say that when you first meet with a new person, you know, there's a lot of things it says in there that are contrary to what you hear in the rooms. But one of the things it says is your, your only responsibility is not just taking them through the steps you have a responsibility to explain AA a little bit to them. 
and give them a heads up about AA. And I am so grateful that the men that I finally found and came in contact with explained to me that a committed home group is part of being an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous. So, as you can tell, if you're a linguistics expert, I don't even think you have to be. I'm not born and raised in Georgia, for sure. Um, I am born and raised in good old New York. I'm born in New York City, raised on Long Island. Um, I told you my sobriety date. I, uh, I, I always say that if I had the power to snap my fingers like a magician and change life, I could have used a time machine when I was just about 12 to 14 years old. I wish I knew what I knew today back then. I did not know what I know today. Um, I had no clue. And I know that that's the path that God placed me on. But when I look back at my life, um, a couple of things that are important to know is that... um, There is a line in Bill's story, a lot of people quote it all the time, it's that I had arrived. And the problem with Bill's story and me is that, first of all, he's a Red Sox fan, so that's first of all. (laughs) Second of all, he went to a prep school, then became an officer in a foreign war, then came home and went to law school, then got a job on Wall Street, Apparently spent in thou- uh, spent in mil- talked in thousands, spent in millions, whatever he said in that line. Um, I had nothing in common with Bill the first time I ever read that story. Um, but that line I had arrived, and now the benefit of many more years of not drinking and being a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous, I had two arrivals in my life. They might not be as impressive as Bill W.'s. But for me, each one of them is an important part of my story. The first one was at 12 years old. Um, Where I grew up, I knew the older kids went to the woods. I did not know what they did in the woods. I had never really been deep into the woods. But for some reason, I had decided in my head that I would like whatever happened in the woods. I had just made that decision. And finally, I reached an age where I was invited into the woods by some older kids. And you can call me uncultured. You can call me shallow. That's not my business. My business is to just admit how I was. But what I can tell you about the woods that night is it had a bonfire. It had heavy metal music. It had girls, and it had alcohol. Specifically for me, two eight-packs of the old Miller Pony Bottle, eight ounces. Um, The day after that first night in the woods, my story is the following. If my life never got better than a bonfire, two eight-packs of Miller Ponies, girls, and heavy metal music, my life would be fine. It did not need to get any better than that. If it was Groundhog Day every day, that would be fine. Now, I did not know at that time that there was a thing called a physical allergy. I did not know that that is one of the two things that make me an alcoholic. I did not know that once a person like me starts drinking, I can't stop. It's not that I don't want to. It's not that I sometimes don't even think it's a good idea to stop. I can't stop. Um, About seven years later, in an Irish bar in New York at age 19, and, you know, I love when I run into other people who got sober young or even maybe came in before they were 21, like me, um, didn't stay, but in and out a long time, um... When you're a bar drinker at a young age, you can never, whether the drinking age was 18 or 21, you can never celebrate your real birthday if you're a young bar drinker. Because when you're 21 and the bartender's pouring you shots for your birthday that your buddy's just bought you and says, 
how old are you? And he's been serving you for two years. You have to say, well, I'm 23 or I'm 22 or something like that. But at 19 years old at an Irish bar in New York, I had another arrival. And it might not be a big deal to a lot of other people, but to me at the time, it was huge. And that was, I heard somebody say about, you know, I guess bars close at 1 o'clock here. Someone referenced 1 o'clock, 5 to 1, 5 to 2, whatever. In New York, it's 4. Every bar closes at 4 a.m. <laughs> um, in fact, the first time I went somewhere else and it didn't close at 4, I was panic-stricken. Um, but at 19 years old, when last call comes at 3.30 or a quarter to 4, at 4 o'clock I became part of a very privileged class of society that I wanted to become a part of. And that is, instead of having to leave the bar when it was locked, I got to, with some other people, sit around the bar while the bartender cleaned up for the last hour and got to drink more. I had been dying for that to happen by age 19. I was dying to be part of that crowd who gets to stay in the bar. Um, you know, I'll just mention one important thing prior to that night in the woods because, you know, I am very honest about where I come from and how broken my family was. I do not blame my alcoholism on it. I do not think it even contributed towards me being an alcoholic. It's contributed towards a lot of other painful things in my life, but not being an alcoholic. Um, but I've, by the time I was 12, although I had drank technically, I mean, it would be hard for me to tell you. I mean, splitting a beer with my dad at Yankee Stadium or a Rangers game or a Jets game, tailgating, um, playing bartender for my dad's and my uncle's. Um, that night in the woods is what I consider my real first night of drinking. Um, but a couple of things happened before that that kind of set my life on a path. Um, one of those things is that, like I said, my family was completely insane. And what I found about that, and I don't know if it's your story, but it's mine and a lot of other people I run into in AA, is a lot of those things that I participated in and witnessed, while not making me an alcoholic, have not made me a fit member of society. They have not made me get along well with others. It's funny because when you run into other people in AA who come from insane families, we tend to laugh about it. We tend to just, we find it hysterical. The more crazy your family is, the funnier it is. And, and I say that because I was a lot of years sober when I was sitting with a therapist. I'm not ashamed to admit that. I believe what the book says. I should take advantage of all help. But a lot of years sober when... I was telling, my, I've found out now that whenever I think a therapist is going to laugh with what I have to say, it's not, it never happens. Um, and, and one of the things that he said, which I just found so unusual, when I said how funny something was, is that he looked just dead straight at me and said, you know, I don't find that funny at all. In fact, I find it kind of sad. Which, in my crazy brain, I had never considered it sad. Just thought it was how people are where I come from. But one of the things that happened right before I went to the woods was I was getting in a lot of trouble in school. And I don't blame getting in trouble on my alcoholism. I don't blame committing crimes on my alcoholism. I don't commit, I don't blame a lot of things on my alcoholism. Um, I know that I tend to get in more trouble when I drink, but I'm very aware um, about the root cause of those problems. But when you come from that, my dad was a deep cover narcotics agent. That doesn't mean like everybody knew he was a cop and some days he wore a uniform and some days. It meant that for years at a time, he lived in the underworld. Um, it meant that some days he came home in a Corvette and a leisure suit, and other days he came home driving a cab, and some days he came home 
in a New York telephone truck with a New York telephone uniform on because he was breaking into somebody's house with a search warrant to plant listening equipment. So my mom was a stay-at-home mom at that point. Now, I can tell you right now, uh, my dad was an out-of-control violent alcoholic. You could tell me I can't diagnose him. I could tell you two things. I could tell you, one, he died of the family liver disease at age 63. He died legally blind because he was diabetic and wouldn't stop drinking. He died missing his left leg from below his knee because the doctor told him when he lost two toes, if you keep drinking, you're going to lose half your foot. And then when he lost half his foot, the doctor told him, if you keep drinking, you're going to lose below your ankle. And then when they took below his ankle, the doctor told him, if you keep drinking, we're probably going to have to take your leg. And he kept drinking. I also know what it says in the chapter working with others. I can't diagnose you. That's your job. But if I'm going to take you through the steps, I have to be convinced that you're a real alcoholic of my type. That is what it says in working with others. Um, my mom, and she would admit this if she was alive, for half of my life, or actually more of my life, was an untreated Al-Anon, untreated codependent. Um, so my first resentment in life, before I even knew, the, I mean, I guess I knew what the word resentment meant from an SAT point of view. I didn't know from an AA point of view. Today, obviously, I know from an AA point of view, and I can tell you that my first AA point of view resentment was my dad. But not because he left the house. I was resentful at my dad because he got his own apartment where he could drink in peace without this Al-Anon lunatic that I had to live with, <laughs> that he left me with. You know, he left me with this mother who was ruining his drinking, so he got out of there, and now I was left there. Um, you know, there's a lot of people in AA who say there's nothing worse than a belly full of booze and a head full of AA. Not me. I will tell you that there's nothing worse than a belly full of booze and your mother's head full of al -Anon. If you're a chronic teenage alcoholic, it is a much, much worse combination. So I only tell you that because if there's one thing I've been an expert at for 54 years now is I am the worst self-advisor in the world, the worst self-sponsor, the worst self life coach, the worst advice giver for myself. Um, there is nobody worse to give myself ideas than me. Um, right before I went into the woods, I made a couple of discoveries in school. Now, because my household was so crazy and there was no Zoom and no iPad and no Xbox and no anything, we're talking right around the start of Atari probably, um, I lost myself in reading in my house. That's how I escaped. I closed the door, and I read whatever I could get my hands on. By the time I was in sixth grade, I had read the whole volume of the encyclopedia from A to Z. Um, and that's not an exaggeration. I'm just reporting facts, because nothing good came from any of that is going to be the point of my story. But by the time I went into junior high, and before that night in the woods... I knew I was decent at baseball. I knew I was decent at street hockey. I knew that, you know, I was a pretty average kid. Not a superstar, but average. But there was one thing that I was knew I was different. And that is I knew that I remembered everything I read. That I knew by the time before I went to junior high. I knew that I pretty much remembered everything a teacher said. I also knew that I could do pretty complicated math in my head and very complicated math on a small piece of paper. And so with that great information, I made some decisions. I made a decision that I was smarter than all the other kids, number one. I made a decision that I was pretty much smarter than most of my teachers. I made a decision that I don't need to do work like other kids. I made a decision that I don't need to take notes. I made a decision that I don't need to bring books home. Um, though that was the best I could do with that information that I discovered. When I showed up to gifted classes in junior high, after that night in the woods and many other nights after that, I was not dressed like I am today. 
I had a uniform, even though I went to public school, it drove my mother crazy, but I wore the same thing every day. I wore black engineer boots, Levi dungarees or corduroys, some kind of heavy metal concert t-shirt. I had a Levi dungaree jacket with an Ozzy Osbourne diary of a madman oil painting on the back of it. I would take a pack of Marlboro Red cigarettes and put them down the front of my pants as I left for school, hopefully had a couple of cigarettes, um, because I, I knew teachers didn't search as good as cops by that age. Um, and when you go and sit in gifted accelerated math, there's not a lot of other Ozzy Osbourne oil paintings. <laughs> um, it's kind of like sitting with all the people who go to a Joe and Charlie big book study, that equivalent of that kind of like geekiness, just in a different direction. Um, and it took me about four months to get kicked out of those, all of those gifted classes. Um, my life from age 14 to a month before my 24th birthday is Groundhog Day. Every day. Same day, repeat, do, repeat. From age 14 to 24, and actually after again, after I was released, I was on some type of court supervision. Juvenile probation, adult probation, or inside for a couple of weeks or a month dealing with a violation of probation so that I could promise the judge I wouldn't get in trouble again and I would leave. Now, I, off, I always say, you know, listen, I love Al-Anon, so I don't like to put down, you know, sometimes I'll say something when I speak and somebody will leave with a resentment because I meant to correct it, but I didn't. I forgot. Um, so if there's anyone here who's a social worker or married to a social worker or has a child who's a social worker, I have great respect for that profession today, immense respect. But I'm a chronic teenage alcoholic. I've never been invited to a meeting with a social worker where I got good news personally. Still 54 years. I've never been invited to a meeting with a social worker where there's good news for me to hear. And at age 14, and by that time, my progression with alcohol is the following. You know, by the time I was in ninth grade, the only thing I thought of on a Monday morning at school is where are we drinking Friday night? And who has fake ID? And whose parents are away? Or whose brother or sister can buy us something? By the time I was in 10th grade, the only thing I really thought about on a Monday morning was, I can't make it to Friday night. Friday night might as well be next summer. Like, I need to drink by Wednesday. And at age 14, I had a little interaction with a social worker and my mother and a juvenile court judge and a juvenile prosecutor. And I had had this thing called the PINS petition filed against me, a person in need of supervision by my school district. And when your dad is a deep cover, undercover narcotics agent, and his life is constantly in danger, and once a year you go to the governor or the senator's office for the private ceremony for law enforcement that can't get medals in public, um, you know, I was a smart kid. I knew how to play that when I got in trouble. I knew how to tell a guidance counselor or a social worker or the school psychologist, if you lived in my crazy household, you would be like me too. Now today I know the answer to some of the questions that I wish I knew back then. Because so many people asked me, Billy, why do you have to drink so much? Billy, why can't you drink like the other kids? Billy, why do you, think, why do you need to take things so far all the time? I didn't even know what that meant, but now I know what it means. Um, but today I know the answer to that question. I wish I would have known it back then because maybe they would have stopped harassing me. Because the answer to that question is very simple. If you know what it feels like for me to be sober, you wouldn't ask me why I drink the way I do or ask me why I drink so much. You would simply know how I feel and that I have to drink like that. Um, that judge uh, was not like the guidance counselors and social workers and school psychologists I'd ran into up to this point. He was not impressed that I could do no homework and get A's on tests. And when I say not impressed, not impressed in the least. And he informed me that if I did not change my attitude, behavior-wise and work-wise at school, 
that he was going to send me to a school where I don't leave, that was going to have a fence around it and a wall around it, and that's where I would live. And truthfully, I can tell you, at age 14, I was not afraid to go there. That's not bragging. I just was not afraid. What I was afraid of is not being able to drink. Like, I remember being in that courtroom, and that's a long time ago. But I remember thinking to myself, with my mother right there, in tears, as she always was, with anything associated with me, um, I cannot live somewhere I can't drink. I was not institutionalized yet, so I didn't know I would be able to drink. But it, So at that age, I was like, I cannot go live there. The judge gave me a whole bunch of requirements, and one of those requirements was I had to go to AA. Um, I had to take the garbage in on Tuesdays and Thursday nights for my mother. I had to do my chores. I couldn't smoke. I couldn't smoke in the house. I had to go to school. I had to go to each class when I went to school. Um, and I had to go to AA. And AA, at 14 years old, was interesting. But I loved that I could smoke with adults. I loved that I could light up a cigarette in peace and not have the school monitor take me to the principal's office or have my mother throw a fit and calling my dad that I'm smoking in the house. Or It was so enjoyable. I couldn't believe that I met a whole bunch of adults that didn't care if I smoked. Now, unfortunately, I was so cool that I was not re interested in the rest of what AA had to offer um, at all. Now, I went to my first anniversary meeting when I was 16 years old. The one thing I knew about manipulation with my mom, even though al -Anon had made her pretty much unmanipulatable, the one thing that was still in my column was if I was grounded, I knew she would let me out to go to AA. And so the last Friday night of the month, I'm stuck at home grounded again on juvenile probation. And I convinced her to let me go to this anniversary meeting. Now, we all just parked in the parking lot. I made her drop me off down the street because I'm too cool to get out of my mother's car. You know, I'm a 16-year-old kid at that point, and I'm worried about what other people are going to think of me getting out of my mom's car. Um, but that night I came in a room like this, a church basement, and um, an old lady turned the lights down halfway. She was like 34. <laughs> an old guy came in with a cake with candles on it, and all these, in my opinion, church-going freaks started singing Happy Birthday. And I remember sitting there like, this is the end of my life. To, like, even if I make it to 54 or 44 or 26, 26, 36, 46, like, this is my life for the rest of my life. This is what I look forward to every month, the last Friday night of the month, and the old lady who turns the lights down halfway, and the guy with the cake and the candles and the singing. Like, I had a whole different life planned for myself. Um, and I heard your stories I heard the how it was, what happened, how it is today. Back then there was a, store, a, uh, a show on TV called Scared Straight where they took all these suburban kids and took them to Rawway Prison and locked them in a cell with a bunch of bad people all day, supposedly, and they would scare them into behaving. Um, that's what I thought AA was, that you wanted to ruin. Like, if I, if I examined, like I always did with my brain, your story... I could admit your bottom was bad to myself. But the 10 or 15 minutes before your bottom got bad, I was looking forward to. That's a big problem when you try to get sober. It's kind of like what it says in the sixth step. You know, if I ever was king of AA for a day, I would change that step immediately and add the language that's in the big book right after that language. Because there's such an important line right after that language that's not on the step, that's not on the shade. It doesn't say just that you're ready for God to remove all these defects of character. It adds a requirement that I admit are objectionable. And I can tell you my problem between age 14 and 24 
in like one sentence. What all you people found objectionable, I either loved or was waiting to do. And what I found objectionable, you people loved. And that is a huge problem when you are trying to get sober. Um, I uh, am one of those people who lost my driver's license before I had one. I've only met people like that in AA. I'm still waiting to meet them somewhere else. You know, I mean, it's incredible. You know, I'm not a big person about the rest of the world and us, like we're some enlightened group of people. I don't believe that. I don't believe that we're better than everyone else. I just know that I'm like a magnet for the worst people in society. So uh, I don't attract the good people. Um, if I saw you get out of your car with a big book, I would think you were a lunatic. I would think that you were showing off or what kind of, everybody knows there's books in the meeting. You don't got to bring your own book with your own writing in it and your own <laughs> highlighting and all that other nonsense. Um, there you go. Um, because I knew better than everyone else. Um, I went to DWI school the first time when I was 16 and a half. Um, now, it's interesting. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more, and, and I'll talk about sobriety. Um, but I get so mad today when I go to a speaker meeting and somebody doesn't talk about their active story. Because there's an old Al-Anon speaker named Mary Pearl. And I love one of her comments, which is, the newcomer will not take your solution unless they know that you have their problem. They need to know and be convinced. The hopeless will only take advice or counsel from somebody that has been equally as hopeless. That's just a you know one of God's laws. I don't know why, but it is. But my family is completely insane. We have a plan for our completely insane Irish Catholic sons. I have 42 first cousins. Um, in my family, by age 12, you are put into two buckets. College material or not college material. If you're not college, if you're college material, um, that's great. If you're not college material, it's that someone has decided you're not smart enough or your behavior is too crazy. So mine was my behavior. And in my family, we have a plan for non-college material Irish Catholic sons. Part one of that plan is called the New York City Police Department, believe it or not. Um, and so when I was at that time, you had to be 16 and a half years old to take the New York City Police Test. You had to be 20 to be hired. Um, when I was 16, a little after I was 16 and a half, my dad didn't live with us, but he, he got me the blue and white civil service book. And um, I did with that book what I did with school. I read it three times, memorized it, took the practice tests. And right before my 17th birthday, my dad had me fill out a form. And uh, a couple of weeks after that, my dad took me to Franklin K. Lane uh, High School in Brooklyn where I stood outside with 500 people online, and I went inside and I took the New York City police test. A couple of weeks after taking that test, I got a letter in the mail that I got a 98, and I was in the top 1,000 on the list, which that's hireable, especially since I was so young. By the time I reached that age, my number would already be passed. Um, the only reason I tell you that story is because by the time I was 17 and a half, I would never pass the background check to be a New York City police officer. That was not a good plan for me. So in my family, we have a backup plan. It's called the New York City Fire Department. So my dad brought me home the red and white book. <laughs> and I studied that book three times back in front and took the practice tests. And I took that test. And then I got a letter in the mail that I got 100 the only way to get higher than 100 is to be a veteran, but I wasn't old enough to even be in the military yet. Um, I got in the top 300 at that time on the list. Uh, but I only tell you that because by the time I was 19 years old, I would never pass the background check to be a New York City firefighter. 
And then my family just goes down and down. Iron workers union, electricians union, pipe fitters union. Any career to get our troubled men or young boys into instant middle class is the goal. Um, but I was such a disaster, I couldn't do any of that. I am the poster child more about alcoholism. That chapter is my life. I am interested in trying anything to stop drinking except stopping drinking. It's kind of like getting up early in the morning. I'm interested in any plan to aid me to get up early in the morning except going to bed early. I'm willing to do anything else. I'm willing to set three alarms, put an alarm on the other side of the room, open the windows so the sun comes in. But going to bed early just does not run in my DNA. Um, I'm in and out of AA. I'm loving drinking. I think I'm a good drinker. I'm a blackout drinker. I am an all-night, party-hard, leave the bar, go to 7-Eleven, get another case of beer, go to the beach, drink till the sun rises, pass out. That is the kind of drinker that I am. I just have also a temper problem and a violence problem that seems to escalate when I drink. Um, all evidence supports that uh, my temper gets worse when I drink. Um, there are some people who will tell you that their worst day sober is better than their best day drinking. That is absolutely not my story. I think they get it from the big book where it says, I wouldn't trade the life I have today for the life of yesteryear. That's a different question. But if you want to ask me if checking into a maximum custody correctional facility at four and a half months sober was better than the first day of spring break Fort Lauderdale, 1986, I'm going to honestly tell you which was a better day. Like, I am confident which was a better day. Um, it's just hands down. There's no even competition. Now, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to be in this group and say this, um, you know, but the, the police were my enemy. I felt like they just had it out for me. I felt like they picked on younger people. I felt like they never enforced DWIs after like middle-aged people leave happy hour. They just enforced DWIs when... See, my problem is wherever I'm drinking, there's something going on where I need to drink at more. That has been my problem my entire drinking career. If I'm in this bar, I think the other bar is better. If I'm at this party, I need to get to that party. Hence, all the DWIs I have. Um, going um, drinking, uh, you know, all this trouble, I get into a car accident where a life is taken, I wound up in a correctional facility, I get sober before I go into that correctional facility, the people in AA don't judge me when I'm out on bail, um, Inside maximum custody, to be perfectly honest, I did perfectly okay, and that structured way of life was fine for me. I got transferred to a minimum custody facility about 11 months later, and that unstructured way of life was not good for me. I am not, I did not have the tools to live in a dorm with 100 other men in bunk beds and tie my s sneakers to a cot so that I knew if somebody stole them overnight. That is, that was a a recipe for disaster for me. But they did have better AA and more AA. And I'm dating myself. I had a Walkman. If you don't know what that is, it was a square device that you could put a cassette in and listen to music. It had a pair of headphones. It was attached. didn't even detach. Um, and they brought in speaker tapes. And it's so funny to be here tonight, you know, and to tell this story, you know, to to walk into that meeting in a correctional facility to, I had already hated one speaker I heard the week before because he said something like sobriety time inside doesn't count. I'm living in a human zoo where it's not easy to stay sober and I could get drunk just as easy and there's lots of things messing with my head inside there. Um, but for whatever reason, in the ratty old box, cardboard box like that book box right there, 
The tape on the top was Tom I, Aberdeen, North Carolina. And I took that tape back to my cot, and that week I listened to it. And that tape, that tape gave me the hope I needed. That tape, um, I remember like it was yesterday, him saying about doing his first fourth step inside, and his quote was, it's the most important day's work he's ever done. And he said that like when he was 30 years sober. And, uh, you know, I think about my first fourth step. It wasn't in a leather-bound spiritual journal. It didn't have perfect rulered columns and rows. But it was the first time I was willing to take a look at my side of the street. Um, one of the only smart decisions I made, you know, back then in my life was... Two members of AA picked me up when I did was discharged. Uh, I went to a diner, got some food, and we went to a lunchtime meeting. I think I was about... I met Joe and Charlie about a year after that. And, you know, it was like a horror show. It was everybody you hate in AA goes to Joe and Charlie. If you don't like active people in AA, do not go to a Joe and Charlie Big Book workshop because all of them for 100 miles converge and they're just like the people I hate in Accelerated Math. They all have highlighters and dictionaries and workbooks and inventory sheets. And, um, you know, it's exactly the crowd, if you're as cool as me, that you do not want to associate with. And usually there's only two or three of them at each meeting. And now I'm in a hotel where there's like 300 of them all together, one happier than the next. But that meeting or that weekend... That weekend, I had been calling myself an alcoholic for almost 13 years, from age 14 to 27, and I realized what it meant to be an alcoholic. I realized what alcoholism is. I realized I do have this physical allergy, and I do have this mental obsession. My mental obsession is so powerful, it tells me I don't have the allergy regardless of the consequences of the night before or the week before. Um, you know, I'll, I'll end talking about this. You know, I've made some huge mistakes sober. I buried both my parents sober. My father of, from this disease. Devastating when I was 11 years sober. I buried my mom when I was 9 years sober. My mom was in a hospice on Christmas Day, 2000, uh, 1999, the night before I wrapped her last gift. And um, that next morning, I got her wig and her makeup and her trolley perfume and her boom box and crazy Irish music that she likes listening to and a couple of Polaroids of her cat. And I stopped at a Dunkin' Donuts and got two large Dunkin' Donuts coffees. And I got to her hospice and tried to put on her wig and her makeup the best that I knew how because it would be the last time her family would ever see her. She would not have another Christmas ever with her family, her sisters, her brothers, anybody. And uh, me and my mom sat in her bed with the bed popped up. And if you've ever dealt with someone that's in that stage of life, they hallucinate a lot. And she looked at me at one point and said, Billy, don't ever leave AA. AA gave me the ability to go get a quart of milk. And I asked her, I said, Mom, what does AA have to do with a quart of milk? And she said, you don't know what it's like to be the parent or the spouse or the child of an alcoholic, especially an active alcoholic. She said, because when I used to run out of milk at night, I would want to go to the store, but then I'd think, you know, at night the stores aren't crowded. And if the stores aren't crowded, I might run into someone that I know. And if I run into someone I know, they might ask me the hardest question anyone could ask me, which is, how are your children? And she said, somewhere in your sobriety timeline and my al timeline, they crisscrossed, and I couldn't wait for somebody to ask me that question. I couldn't wait to shout from the rooftops, the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous and al -Anon family groups. Now, like I said, I've made lots of mistakes, gone back to school, 
have a career that I love. It's amazing. Gotten married, bought a house, then bought another house. All things that are impossible for a person like me. But what I'll end on is I'll tell you this. I have served as a delegate to the General Service Conference when I was very young. Uh, in fact, I served with Bill A., if you remember him. Um, Bill A., I believe, lived in Raleigh, right? Um, I also served four years as a director on the A World Services Board and four years as a trustee and two years as a chair of the A World Services Board. Um, and I don't tell you that to impress you. I tell you that, that how is it possible that I put my hand up in the air to be an alternate GSR and three years ago, I rotated out as the chair of the AA World Services Board. But I want to tell you that a couple of months after I rotated out, I was at a conference speaking, and there was an ask it basket. And they gave the speakers the questions out of the basket, and I got to read it. And my question was simple. What did you learn being a trustee? And I'm just going to share my answer and be quiet. Here's my answer. Same today as it was then, except with one additional fact. Today, all over the world, on Zoom or in person, thousands of people will go to their first AA meeting. I know that. They will be welcomed with bad coffee, uncomfortable chairs, or Zoom bombers, or whatever the craziness going on is. But I know that thousands are going to their first meeting. I love AA so much that I can't wait to hear Zoom bombers celebrate their anniversaries from finding AA as a result of being a Zoom bomber. But I know that a year from now, the thousands of people who are going to AA today for the first time, a lot of them will celebrate their first anniversary. And when you go to an anniversary meeting and it's somebody's first and it's special and you see their parents or their siblings or their spouses and their tears in their eyes, and their wonderment, because they look around at this odd collection of people, and they can't believe that all the money and all the love they tried to fix their alcoholics' problems didn't work, and this odd collection of people has somehow given their family something that they couldn't buy and couldn't love, I learned that as a trustee. But unfortunately, I also learned that yesterday, there were a lot of people alive with my disease who today are not alive. That is a fact of the ugly disease of alcoholism, that the 12 and 12 calls the rapacious creditor. Six months ago, during COVID, long after I told this story, because people were not allowed at funerals, I had to take pictures of my brother, unable to let go of his husband's coffin because his husband had been in and out for four years after being 10 years sober and couldn't take it anymore, so he checked himself into a hotel and took his own life. And to see that devastation in my family, up close, personal, that this is the real story of alcoholism. Yes, I've seen Metallica over live, 50, over, live over 50 times. Yes, I've golfed at Pebble Beach. Yes, I've seen the Yankees beat the Phillies in person, and I made it to the bottom of the ninth inning without going to the security office. Um, I've been given things that a person like me, it is amazing. But I do not ever let myself forget how ugly this disease is. And that like Don P. used to say, it is a daily reprieve. And the only people besides us who use the word reprieve are governors. And he used to stress that all the time. They're the only other people that use that word. And that my spiritual condition is based on a daily reprieve. Thank you for having me here tonight.